that in the future, when we talk about STEM, it's going to include something very near and dear to all of us. I am David Schwartzberg. I'm a senior manager of security and privacy at Mobile Iron. I'm also the president, one of the founders of Hack for Kids. My running mate, who couldn't be here, he's out now, right? I think he's in Iowa, trying to also spread the, the good word of STEM. Uh, Chris Sistrunk, he's unavailable, but he, uh, so you could get him on Twitter. He's a consultant at FireEye, and um, he was one of the organizers for B-Sides Jackson in Mississippi. But like any good campaign, we need to have some kind of slogan. You know, make STEM great again is good. But I also think no child's email should be left behind and they all should have their own server. Why did it just do that? <laughs> it did not like the graphic. Uh, you guys hit something over there? And that concludes our presentation for today. We hope you learned a lot. Makes them great again. Yes. Well, every time you leave, something happens with the frequencies and the signals all get jacked. Chris, he wants to build a firewall and make IT pay for it, make SCADA great again, because Chris is one of the SCADA guys that we all rely on. So he does a, um, I think, a Bill Clinton voice when he does that, so it sounds pretty good. But as a part, you know, we're big patriots, so USB, USB, USB. That concludes the funny part of the presentation. So you, you probably heard of STEM. Raise your hand if you never heard of STEM before. Right. Were you trolling or serious, sir? OK, good. He wasn't trolling. So uh, STEM is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, and math. It was created in order to help make um, the United States to be much more competitive globally, along with uh, other nations that were ahead of us in these different disciplines because our students or our kids weren't learning these skills and then they were going out into the job market and they were, weren't really qualified or they weren't able to compete with lower labor costs that were international but a lot more like talent. It was created back in 1997 during the National Science Foundation. Um, that's where they first used it and they just said this is what we're going to adopt and then they started to kind of spread the word throughout education. And it's not just early childhood education, it's also a big part of any um, higher education as well. And you can see that there's more and more type of IT courses, but there's also STEM courses. Now, um, STEM doesn't, you know, we think, I, I personally always embrace STEM as being something that's mathematical te technology and um, engineering related, but there's also the science, right? You know, a lot of the technology, it's all applied science. So keep that in mind during the presentation. In 2010, someone said, you know, you kind of left out art. We need more art. So they created STEAM. It's a nice acronym. I have nothing against art. I love art. I think it's wonderful. Um, but, you know, some, it's not for everyone. Not, you can't be good at everything, right? You got to pick a few things and kind of focus. Then, in 2014, there was a Huffington Post article, which the link is there, available for you, that said, now we need to have STREAM. Let's include reading in that acronym. And it just kind of gets longer and longer and longer. And, and that's all good stuff. Not saying that we don't need these things. But I, I want to focus on STEM. And so does Obama. Obama um, definitely believes we need to expand. And there goes an anti-Obama guy right there. See you later. Good luck. Um, <laughs> Uh, they, they allocated um, millions and millions of dollars to different types of grants and programs in education focused on STEM, um, and even in some cases including cybersecurity, which I think is also pretty phenomenal because now there's organizations out there, including maybe your, your kid's school, your friend's kid's school, your relative's kid's school, um, can get these grant funds and start to have STEM programs because it always comes down to cost. Everything needs some funding. And one of the things that uh, Obama said, and I'm just going to read this directly so I don't misquote, is it is, an it is an approach to the world, a critical way to understand and explore and engage with the world, and then have the capacity to change the world. Hmm, what does this sound like to you? Hack the planet, maybe? 
So how do we come up with this idea, Chris and I? We were just kind of goofing around in some uh, hangout or something, and we were just kind of joking around like, hey, we need more, you know, hacking and STEM and stuff. I don't know if you could, yeah, you can read that. So we were trying to come up with a new acronym, right? You know, there's STEM and STEAM and STREAM. But, like, how do you put the H in there? Because a lot of times the H is silent or it modifies a consonant. So we're like, how about, like... Hi, folks. Iron Geek here. Unfortunately, we had another Avid Media freeze up, so we have no audio until about the 7 minute 50 second mark. Sorry for the problems. kind of really talk about some challenges. Who here began in IT as a hobby? Kind of <laughs> nearly unanimous, except for the apathetic person that's holding their head in their hand that says, I'm not doing anything but sitting and listening and leaving when I'm bored of you. The, um, the hobbyist turned it into a career. I remember in college, I was able to take some programming courses, but there really wasn't anything for networking or TCP IP and kind of understanding all the switching and how that worked. Or even when like web servers kind of started to get a stronger and stronger presence, there wasn't a lot, but then, oh, write some code. But who's going to maintain the box? That was missing. Um, so really kind of the idea too is you got into it because you like to play video games, let's be honest. I like to be a gamer. I had to take a break for a while when I tried to find a wife and started to have a family. But now that my kids are bigger, I get to play Overwatch and Clash Royale with them. Life is good. You'll get there. But the, the gaming, you wanted to kind of tweak it, right? You wanted to win. You wanted to beat the developers. And you were kind of willing to do whatever you had to do. Um, one person that I know, I'm not going to name him, but he's a big supporter of Hack for Kids, and he's been speaking about some of the things that he did with um, Diablo 2. Who remembers playing Diablo 2, and then there were some duped items, and you might have bought it from the auction, and then your account got deleted? Yeah. Are you feeling the chills like I am? He did that, because he wanted to beat the game, and they came up with creative ways to dupe items. And, and that was not something that they felt was malicious. He and his brother were teenagers. They wanted to just win. And they were smart enough to analyze the code and trick people out of their account information and do other things. He didn't quite realize he was being like a criminal. He just thought he was being mean. 
But that's some of the things. Now he works for good. He works in the credit card industry. He's trying to keep our data safe at some major payers and, and grocery stores. So, you know, that's a really good example of somebody who broke the rules, but understood how things worked, but then kind of really used their powers for good instead of evil. Um, like these gentlemen. So you got like Uncle Kevin right there. He's running a big company. He's sitting on the, the Iron Throne. And then you got Uncle Dave right there. Does he look like a hacker to you? He looks like an accountant to me. Would you agree? Maybe a bookkeeper, low paid? So now it's become this career, right? So you go from this hacking Joe to this hacking pro. And a lot of the times, and we all know this, is like people come up here, oh, you're doing it wrong. Well, what's the right way to do it? Oh, you figure that out. Or they might have a solution, but it kind of works for them and sort of does or doesn't work for you. And, and that's part of we want this to work for everybody. It's really very important to us. Not to mention, it's increased in the media, right? They twisted that word, that beautiful, sensual, ever so important word, hacker, and twisted it into something meaning cyber criminal. Uh, this one article right here, it's so fantastic. It's Hackers can turn your home computer into a bomb from miles of way away. How ridiculous is that? We know you can't really do that. You can turn it into a bomb if you have physical access, but not from miles away. Well, you're still questioning. This was back, I think, in 2000 or later. They might have still had Mercury in the computers back then. But the, the concept of the media is kind of creating all this false hype. There's another one, too, on Fox News where some hackers broke into a dam, so those damn hackers kind of interrupted, um, I guess, some services for some people with industrial controls. And, you know, that hit Fox News, right? This stuff is all over the place. It's constantly in our face. Who doesn't watch Mr. Robot? Oh, right. Brave souls, brave souls. So I figured I'd get fewer of you than asking the question the other way. And, and this really stands out because, you know, if you sell the movie Sneakers, you know, they, they did a really good job of kind of showing some of the, the tools and how they work. But then when you watch, like, the movie The Net, you kind of moan and groan. And you're like, God, here we go again. Roll your eyes. And Mr. Robot, if you don't watch it or if you haven't heard, they use real tools. They really speak the language. And they have really good technology consultants on staff to make sure that they're using the words properly and it's not Hollywood sensationalized. There is a reality to it where you, you know, doing certain things in tech, you kind of like, all right, I'm going to DD this image and walk away, get some coffee and come back and hope it's done. It's not very exciting to watch that on TV, so it takes 10 seconds. That's, you know, you got to do that. But they're, they're reason, using real tools and commands. It's, it's actually pretty, <laughs> it's actually really amazing if you haven't seen it. Highly encourage it. But it's important. So the, the kind of the message there is now you have somebody who's got an interest or they're a hobbyist in IT. And now they watch Mr. Robot. And they download set and they do a phone call and text message and they trick somebody. Now they're a hacker, right? You can answer or not, but no. Not really. Not really. They're using a tool. So the important part there is, as a community, we need to make sure that these people who have an interest really start to do it the right way. It's kind of obvious. But it's easy for them to do it the wrong way and then just start to make the community not look so you know, above board. And again, like the whole work shortage, um, CSO Online, they, they put an article out, 0% cybersecurity unemployment. There's 1 million jobs unfilled. Now, I know some people in IT that are either looking to switch jobs or they're just unemployed. There's, there's so unemployed people out there. For whatever reason, they're not able to get a job. And it's unfortunate considering that there's a million unfilled jobs. So now you think, why is that? Is it them? Is it the qualifications like way up here? I remember um, somebody gave a talk in Chicago about how um, I think I think Cali was out for a year, and one of the requirements on the resume was minimum five years Cali experience. It's possible. I mean, maybe they meant backtrack, right? But 
it goes to show you that the people that are creating or defining the requirements to be qualified don't understand them. How do you reach their expectation if it's unrealistic? So um, Speak with the Geek, Swag, they were out in Vegas during InfoSec summer camp and they were interviewing a bunch of people and how do we solve this problem? How are we going to fill these one million positions that are out there? And I, I encourage you, I created a bit.ly because their link was like ridiculously long, but I encourage you to check out the video. It's, it's a few minutes, but it, um, it the, the answers that some people provided, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, were some were like really good and others were like, the answer was, I don't know. I mean, almost kind of metaphysical there, or philosophical, right? Like, how are we going to do this? I really don't know. Yeah. Something to think about. Now let's talk about the kids for a minute. Because while they're a big part of it, you know, we're all hackers, we're pretty much grown up. I see that there are a couple of kids in the room, maybe teenagers or college students. But the younger ones, think back. Do you remember when you were two? And you asked your parents why a lot. And even when they answered your question, you asked why again. And you kept asking why until they yelled at you. Yeah, a couple of people sniffering. They just naturally want to try to understand things. And, and that makes them really good hackers. Um, they also like to question authority. They'll, uh, one of my, my, well, I got three boys, um, just, Slash kid zero, kid one, and kid two, two being the youngest. So slash zero, he likes to um, be very persistent when we he asks for something, and then we say no, and he asks again, and we say no, and then he moves on to the other parent, and same kind of experience. So he's his persistence kind of taught him a little social engineering. So he would n not even ask my wife. And come to me and say, "Hey, can I buy that um, that purchase inside of Clash Royale?" I'm like, "Well, you know, we don't really like doing that." What'd your mom say? I'm trying to play the game back on him. Oh, she said, "Ask you." Uh, do I need to check with her? Because <laughs> I don't think she would have said that. Um, so you know, they they get clever. They're trying these little things, and these are the same kind of tricks that we use if you do physical pen tests to get into a building or get information from people if you're calling them up on the phone. Very clever. He's um. He also did another one on my wife. He so in our house, um, we've got all kinds of screens. But you do your homework, you can go on screens. You get grounded, you do your homework, you read a book or something else. You don't get to go on screens. And my wife would sometimes let them borrow her iPhone. Well, uh, he one when he was allowed to be on screen, he noticed that in order to register his fingerprint, it required a passcode, right, with Touch ID. And what happened was um, he had her unlock the phone, kind of was messing around in there, and then said, Mom, I locked the phone again. Can you please type in your passcode? She's not a very technical person, so she just was like, sure, punched it in, and registered his finger to touch ID. So when he got grounded, he grabs her phone, authenticates, and he's on his screens. And she's like, wait a minute, aren't you grounded? How'd you get on? And he's like, ha, ha, ha. So, you know, through figuring out the technology and then a little social engineering, he got what he wants. Like there was the motivation and the incentive, right? And with a little bit of knowledge, he had success. So they're, they're pretty innovative. Um, we've got plenty of these stories, but I don't want to make my wife look too bad. This is being recorded. So um, kind of going back to some other stories, right? There was this one uh, five-year-old boy played his dad's Xbox. And, you know, if you use Xbox nowadays, right, you got to log in. And kid was home, dad was at work, had the controller just mashing the buttons. He, I think he was like fuzzing the Xbox and he performed like a buffer overflow, which then got him in. And it's really cute because there's a video attached to that website with the news. He's like, yeah, I got in, playing video games. He found a vol in Xbox and his dad being an IT reported it to them and the kid actually got credit because if you look through the, the release notes, you'll see, you know, like instead of like a, a research 
kind of lab or something. It's like individual, and it's this five-year-old. It's pretty cool. So there's there's the desire to get something at any means, and we'll try anything to get there. Kind of part of the hacker mentality, right? I have another one for you. I hope the audio works. That's too bad. Wait a minute. One, four, nine, two. Okay. And one, four, nine, two. Is it okay to share your password with people? Yeah. I'm sorry, what'd you say? Yeah. Yeah. It's okay to share your passcode with people. That was kid. Um, or slash kid two. He was two years old back then when we took the video. And I thought it was just kind of cute at the time, but it actually dawned on me some days later, I'm a little slow, that this is a um, systematic problem, or should I say systemic problem, excuse me. He can't read. He can recognize numbers. He actually just started speaking kind of regularly a few maybe a couple months before that but he knew the pattern to unlock the iPad or the tablet because he wanted to watch videos or play a game goes back again motivations and incentives that was his reward so he memorized the pattern but again you know he's two he doesn't quite understand you know um, stimulus response or consequences or risk or any of the things that we learn about to protect data so he thinks it's fine. Yeah, anyone can do this. This is great. Fortunately, there's nothing on there, and it took us about two years for him to change the passcode because he didn't want to do it, and we didn't want to make it hard, you know, difficult for him to get back in there. But now, and I think this is really cool, is he understands. He does look, when we change the passcode. No one knows it, but you know, kid two and myself. He won't even tell my wife. So. If you ever want to have fun with your spouse, it's a great way when you kind of start to get the kids to do things and they don't want to share it and they start to feel like, oh. But it's the important part is he now gets it. He's getting that this is something, it's just four codes, keep it simple. But he's going to continue to mature and understand the importance of a secure password. I do stuff with scouts and I teach them, uh, it's called the cyber chip. First thing we cover is Good bad passwords and bad passwords. Let's let's go over that. And when we cover it, by the time they're done, they're coming up with some really strong passwords that they can remember. Some of them are a little too ridiculous, but you know they use the word "but" a lot. But it's okay. I don't know if it is "but" in the dictionary. I think it is. So still dictionary attack that one. Now Chris um, and my running mate, his son also very curious and does some really fun things. He learned how to use Scratch. Scratch is a MIT project for kids to write code in a Lego kind of block style UI. And if it's a syntax error, instead of it going together and throwing an error, it actually won't let the pieces connect. And then there's values and variables that they can modify. So Chris's son wanted to make a Pong game. So he builds his Pong game. And when he does it, he's like, well, every time the ball gets hit by the paddle, make it bigger. It gets hit on the other side, it gets bigger until it's like off the screen and play a sound and change colors. And you got this like psychedelic, noisy cacophony going on. And Chris's wife's like, what the heck is going on in there? And that's kind of fun. Um, the other one was like, um, kind of make the paddle smaller and do all these other crazy things, right? Instead of just, I have a game, and this is the game, and that's it, and I'm going to play it this way. He's changing it. He's making it his own. He wants to see what happens when he goes beyond the boundaries. Being a nine-year-old, this was the, nine, the title of the app, apropos, but hey, we're no better. So there's all these organizations, I mentioned some before, that are focused on STEM and hoping that they adopt uh, STEM with an H or STEM or something like that. And, and Hack for Kids, which is very near and dear to me, came about, and it's not a unique idea. 
there's uh, other groups out there. It was like DEF CON Kids, which became Roots Asylum, and that was kind of the, I guess, the switch that went off in my mind, like, yeah, we need to do this, because I'm at, I live in Chicago, in the Midwest, because it was all very West Coast focus, and there was Hack Kid and uh, San Jose, and if you don't know, like, Roots Asylums in Las Vegas. And I was like, well, well we got to bring it to other people, too, so why don't we kind of, like, partner up with other conferences, like NOLACON, he's falling asleep, there you go, um, <laughs> and GERCON, and do a Hack for Kids with them, and we're actually doing one tomorrow. So that concept, and we've done other, like Detroit and other areas, um, uh, kind of getting ahead of myself, but there's Belgium, we're also doing one in, we're, we're working on doing one in Toronto next week. So this is really taking off. And it's great, but there's also like Interrupt or Cyber Boot Camp, which might be near you. You should look into those. Um, so there's a lot of other, there's a lot of different programs, and there's a lot of, or I should say, there's some online programs. And the one caution that I have to offer to you is when you look at the price and you look at the education that um, the student would be getting, you got to see if there's value. Because some of them are like $250 for a year just to learn. I think some basic, like intro to Java. It's nice, they give you like a year to do that, but is it really worth $250? You can buy yourself a nice book for $40, $50, $60 and have that perpetually. Um, it's just me, um, I'm like that. I'm an accountant by original education, got into IT and cybersecurity, but I look at the value of those things. Um, but that's kind of the important message, is a lot of these organizations are doing STEM with an H today, and you should look for one near you. So I thought I'd tell you some more stories. So, um, and again, Hack for Kids being near and dear to me, I can talk directly about some of the things that uh, we have seen there. And uh, I'll tell you about Bob. So, in 2015, we did a Hack for Kids in Indianapolis. Now, Bob is 14 years old and has an interest in computers and plays games, just kind of like we did. and kind of, you know, use other apps and wants to write some code. But when he came in and we showed him the room, which is maybe a quarter the size of this one, he just kind of looked around and he saw this sign on the wall that said Crypto Corner. He goes, ah, we'll check this out. What is this? So he's sitting there and he was learning about converting binary and base 64 and some other, like, you know, rotation ciphers and stuff like that. Simple things you could do with a computer and it's done in seconds, but he was doing it by hand and we had eight challenges there. He didn't leave. He didn't leave that spot the entire day. Even when we went on break, Robert Wagner right there is a board member of Hack for Kids, we go to lunch and we came back and Bob was standing outside the door waiting to continue. So we let him in, he sat right down and it, I'm, I'm getting chills thinking about this, but it was amazing because this is somebody who's never done this before and found within himself a passion for math that he didn't know existed. It was fun. And I think what t makes the story even better is when I emailed his father, say, oh, you know, what did Bob think of Hack for Kids? He replied, yeah, you know, he said it was good. He had fun. So... You know, I'm a parent, right? My kids go, they do something. They go to camp or whatever. Oh, how was it? What'd you do? Nothing. What'd you learn? Nothing. Ah, nice talking to you. Um, but, and that's kind of like, you know, that's the parent-child relationship sometimes. And that was what happened with Bob and his dad. So I wrote up this email explaining everything to his dad about how impressed we were with his focus and dedication to solving these problems and that we've never seen anyone do this before. There's something inside of him that you should nurture and take further. And his father replied, like, gobsmacked, like, I had no idea. I did not know he liked this so much. Thank you. All right? This is what we're trying to do. We're changing lives, slowly but surely and bit by bit. But it's also that communal effort, right? Um, so then uh, Bob's dad said, hey, we're gonna go to Hack the Kids in Chicago. And he was asking, you guys gonna have more of these challenges? And I said, yeah, we're gonna make new ones. We actually did one in Orabesh uh, for him. Okay, uh, only two people got that. Orabesh is the language from Star Wars. <laughs> There's a translator online. Um, if you need to know the story of it, briefly, when you looked at the first Star Wars movie and that those characters scroll up, they meant absolutely nothing. But somebody 
collected all the characters and made it into an alphabet. And we used that as a way to create a secret message and gave Bob some more fun. So since then, Bob's been to 4 Hack for Kids. And we always intentionally do new things for him, like a 3D printed board in Braille, so he has to like figure out the Braille, and kid loves it. So that's the story of Bob. So then there's the story of Alice. Now, so you could appreciate this, I have to give you a little bit of background about Alice. Um, we met her this year at B-Sides Detroit, where we did a Hack for Kids there. And um, what her, her mom told me was, uh, she was about 12, and she came from a background of uh, her biological parents. Well, I think one was an alcoholic, another one was a chemical abuser. So for Alice growing up, certain things that most kids have, like expect, were a luxury. So she had a really rough start in the world. And uh, eventually she went to foster care, and her adopted mom, who I met, you know, they gave her some time to kind of adjust and get used to going to school regularly and all those things. And then she started to show more of an interest in computers. So she said, I'm going to bring her to Hack for Kids. And we're like, cool. Um, so she did this sumo bot contest. Now, this is somebody who's never done this before, never took uh, the controller, uh, the EV4 controller, and then built a robot and then battled it against other robots after kind of doing the R&D and the tweaking on the power and the speed. So not only did she have a great time and learn more about herself, she took first place. She got, she got first place, and she got a $25 gift card for that. Because of that, I mean, think about it. Her life is changing. $25 to a kid might as well be a million, right? It's not much to us, but it's a ton of money to them. And then she did our online CTF, where she got involved with some crypto. She did some of our simple encoding and even some of the more complex encoding. And you might think, well, she probably got some help from mom, and maybe she did. But one of the things that we really focus on communicating with the parents is not to be like that helicopter parent kind of overseeing to make sure their kid's successful by doing the work for them. Um, not judging, but there's a lot of parents that do that. We use a phrase that's very simple. Do you want time or coaching? And we let them be in control of what happens in those next few minutes. And if they want more time, you step back. They want some coaching, we give them some hints and suggestions on how they're approaching the problem so that they learn. Well, she did really well with the crypto. She did really well with the information gathering, which is like being a pen tester. Uh, she also did really well with the lock picking. She got all the way up to from a, a single pin lock to a six pin lock and the handcuffs. So she swept the lock picking challenges. She did them all. And then we also had a, um, a badge challenge, which, come on slide. Uh, this badge had um, a secret message scrolling across that was in Braille, and again, with some coaching and time from her mom, she was able to figure it out, and she got that one. The other ones were kind of tough, but we just wanted to see what the, you know what they know and how far they'll go. And it was really kind of cool because you know she was all like excited that she was doing so well in the sumo bot contest, and you know she didn't get that prize, so she gets first prize for that at the end of the day, and then. She ties for first place in the CTF. That was really cool. So of course, at that point, she gets to pick of all the different prizes we have on the table what she wanted, and she went with the Kana kit, so now she has her own small personal computer at home. Right? She doesn't need to use her parents' PC or, or laptop or Mac. So these are just a couple stories. I could tell you more, but you know, you could see if you haven't gotten chills, I didn't do a good job. Because I've been getting chills telling you the whole time. Um, kind of, I kind of told you some of this information already, so I might just skip it, but what kind of impact are we making? So since 2014, when we started doing this, we had 40 kids at our first Chicago event, and then since then, in 2015, by the end, we had about 100, no, it was 115 kids in, in all the different uh, four events that we did that year, and then including up to the last three, not tomorrow, we were at 166, and we're hoping between um, all the events we do in October will be... Uh, changing another hundred lives for the better. Now, what happens after all this? What's next? Well, as they get older, they could become mentors. After they learn how to be mentors 
from us. We should be their first mentors. We also should be teaching them leadership. And, and what does that mean? Does that mean yelling at people and what they're doing wrong? Or does that mean, hey, I see you doing something. I did it before too. Do you need coaching or time? And let that person who needs help be led by a kid who's already been down that path. Um, some of the other things that we're doing, like just different activity stations, like Raspberry Pi. I talked about the crypto. We've done stuff with uh, Python for kids. So, like, thank you, no starch press. We have permission to use that term that or the, that title of the book. Uh, and they always donate books to the events for us to give to the kids. So, one of the prizes we give away is a virtual Minecraft server. So, if you can get this book to company that learn to program with Minecraft, it's kind of like a win-win, right? They got their own server they can write code on. And then we do the CTFs, and um, that's the URL for the server. It will be, um, the, the server's up, but the game is off right now. We're going to turn it on tomorrow morning. If you want to, feel free to make yourself an account, poke around, even answer a couple questions. But it's really for the kids, so when they're there, like, you know, let's just say you answer them all, you get the most points. I'm not going to give you a prize if you're an adult, but if you're a kid, yeah. So, but it's open. We're, we're very focused on... Um, uh, inclusion. We don't want anyone to ever feel like they can't do anything or benefit. Because there are probably some adults that might take a shot at this and go, man, some of these are hard. And actually, a couple of them are really hard. Because we just want to see what these kids are capable of doing. Now, you remember the reading rainbow? <laughs> you know, if you ever read 2600 and people like write in the letters, I love the letters. Hey, I want to get into hacking. What do I do? Read. Read some more. When you get tired of reading, read some more. When it hurts, read. And when you're bleeding out your eyes, keep reading. It's like you don't stop. And, and that's what we want to do. It's like kids are learning through videos and YouTube. In some ways, it's good. In some ways, it's they got to remember to read, too. Um, and, and we need to be that role model, like crack open a magazine or a book and read the books, maybe with your kids if they're not too technical, if you, or get your kids one of the kids' programming books or something, and do it with them. And when they see you using, using, see you using the books, they're going to copy you. Keep it hands on. We already know that. It reinforces the knowledge. But don't have them read a chapter of a book and then go do something. I'm trying to see if I can get, um, Kid Zero to become A plus certified. And the first thing I go, here's a book. It's got a thousand pages. Let me know when you need help. I made a huge mistake. He read the first page and goes, I don't know what the heck's going on in here. I can't do this. So we're, we're having a plan now where we're going to go through paragraph by paragraph. Read it together. What didn't you understand? Let me explain it to you. You want to see what that looks like? It's in my basement in a bin. It's got dust on it, but you can still see it. And then using that methodology will reinforce it. And I'm hoping in a year or two that, you know, before he goes into high school, he'll be A-plus certified. Or at least stretch goal, or that's the best case, before he graduates high school, he'll be A-plus certified so he can even get a job and, you know, make some money in college. And then the community, I mean, we're here, right? We believe in the community, or we're trying to. Um, there are some people out there that make it difficult, but we got to shrug them aside. Focus on what we know is right. Uh, I meant to say this sooner, but I'm going to tell you, um, uh, we're all mostly technical people here, so you probably never heard of Russell Ackoff. He's a well-known economist. He said, and I'm going to paraphrase, when we do something wrong right, the wronger we become. But when we do something right wrong, the righter we become. It's okay to make mistakes if you're doing it the right way. There are people that tell us in our industry we're doing it the wrong way, but without coaching or time to do it the right way. We need to do it the right way, wrong, so we can get better at it. And I think we are a little bit, but we're kind of all pulling in different directions. Kind of bring it together. And then mentorship. Uh, I mentioned this before, but I don't think I can mention it enough. We need to mentor one another, and we need to mentor the next generation. Otherwise, they're going to be inheriting all of our problems that we've created, all the problems we can't solve, and in some cases, these kids are becoming really lazy because if they don't get that immediate gratification that a problem solved, they lose interest. We like what we do because of that gratification. 
We need to show them it might take time, but you'll get there. Don't give up. Another little case study. So I talked mainly, you know, what we usually do stuff is with kids, 7 to 17. But what about these other kids kind of going into college? Somebody approached me on the Internet not too long ago and said, hey, why don't you guys start up like a scholarship fund to send some kids going into college to DEF CON? Sound like a good idea. Kind of tweeted about it. Some people didn't think it was a good idea. But meanwhile, right in the heart of DEF CON is Roots Asylum. And it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But sending some kids off to, you know, hack all the things and drink all the booze, or drink all the booze and hack all the things, because after you drink enough, you say it backwards, um, we didn't want that. And we didn't want them to be there to think that, or their parents to think that we're, we were encouraging them to be cyber criminals. We put out a application and the responses we got were from students who were leaders in their school. They were doing things with uh, extracurricular activities. Some of them were active in sports. Some of them were playing music. And uh, a lot of them were all like focused either on IT or InfoSec or both as a career. So one of them that really kind of stood out the most to everybody reviewing, and we did like a, a double blind review, right? So. Um, if you're not familiar with that term, the reviewers, they get the information, they don't know who they're reviewing, and they don't know what each other is saying about the individual people being reviewed. So nobody can influence anybody. And this one kid, um, he not only is like rocking it in high school, he's also an Eagle Scout, he, which if you're familiar with the program, that's a major accomplishment. He was also um, active in Cyber Patriot. So the first year he joined, he was on the team figuring it out. The next year, his team, I think, placed third. And then this year, he was the captain of the team, and they took first place in their national division with Cyber Patriot. I'm getting chills saying that. I'm so impressed by this kid. And he was cool to hang out with. You picture, you know, just a teenager, just kind of full of acne and glasses and matted, greasy hair. But it was actually pretty fun to hang out with. And we were doing stuff and kind of going around and, then you know, introducing them to different people in the industry, and they had a great time. And they, were, they wrote up uh, their experiences, and we're kind of reviewing them. We want to scrub names for privacy reasons, but we're going to release their uh, experiences publicly, so then you guys can see, like people, because without people making donations to this and, and providing the funds, we couldn't have sent them. If, you, if you've never been to DEF CON this year, the badge was two hundred and forty dollars. And to show you my dedication. I won a CTF and got a DEF CON badge and donated it directly to this because I believe that was important. Um, and not that, you know, yay me, but it's like, you gotta give, you gotta give, and uh, you get back. <laughs> Have I lost you guys yet? Still there? So there's a lot of challenges, right? Um, we know that hacking is viewed to be something negative in, in the media light. The more we do to make that different, even if we're, we're doing it right but wrong, we'll start to get it righter. Uh, there's a lack, a lack of funds and, and maker spaces and hacker spaces. Like I know um, from Chris giving this presentation with me in Mississippi, there are no hacker or maker spaces around anywhere for him. He was saying that his libraries are just going to start to get funds for 3D printers, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, and, and that's going to get kids interested in doing this stuff. And, and just even things in rural areas. So there's a, um, a rural tech fund website if you want to go and make a donation. But none of this can happen without some kind of funding. A little bit helps. And even measuring metrics. I tell you these stories, but if I never see Alice or Bob again, we don't know the actual um, success level we reached with them. We do take surveys, we do track their progress, especially stuff online with the CTF, but it's very difficult. We also teach things like anti-cyber bullying. How do we know if they reacted the way we taught them when they were being bullied online, or if they properly diffused the bully picking on someone else rather than being a participant and laughing along because they don't want to be the victim? It's, it's nearly impossible to measure. And we send out surveys, we always send out surveys after the events, and we do get some good data and commentary from people. Um, but it's a tricky thing. 
more reporting baselines. This is kind of some of the real drier stuff in the talk. But we're, we're thinking of doing some more of this online because when you're online, you get a lot of metrics. You can see um, information about the person in their private profile, like their age. You can figure out, for example, if they tried a challenge and didn't finish it. Right? Somebody goes up to the lock picking table. We're not watching them. They try and pick a lock and they walk away. But we don't know if they tried 10 seconds or 10 minutes. Right? So they might have needed more time or more help. But if you're online doing some of this stuff, you can see exactly how long they tried. Or, oh wow, they're going through this really quick. Are they really bright or is someone else doing this for them? So you get a lot more um, intelligence. And none of this can really be done without you folks. We need you. Remember, this is my political campaign to make STEM great again. And it's the community. you got to participate. You don't have to sit down at a table with a kid or somebody and be a mentor, but maybe talk to some people in your area that might be more comfortable about just small things. Just maybe having a meetup and like in your house or like, you know, maybe one of the other parents are doing it with a few kids just build a box, install Linux in the cloud, get a Raspberry Pi and learn how to unbox it, you know, turn it into a Minecraft server, all that stuff. So in conclusion, um, this is very exciting and in, in, in time, very exciting times and there's a lot that's emerging. Super exciting because we're part of it and we as a collective are steering its direction. And it's always something emerging. I mean, I don't want to go into IoT. You know, you guys will know about what's going on there and um, autonomous vehicles. That make me nervous. Kind of cool but scary at the same time. What are the risks? Well, until we have one, we don't really know how to break it. But there's, I'm sure there's some weaknesses. And these, these small changes in their life make a huge lasting impact. Like Alice and Bob, I hope they come back and be a mentor at Hack for Kids because it's a great story. Um, continue like the value of like steam and stream. Remember art and reading is important, but you also want to include hacking. There's still plenty to do. And on, on a final note, you know, how we need a theme song. So instead of, uh, you know, we're going to drink all the Kool-Aid and we're going to hack all the things. Oh yeah. <laughs> Chris is comedy. So get out your ballots, check for STEM, check STEM off with an H. Remember, it's important that you vote this year and make STEM great again. Thank you.